I said, she, she wrote the book on CBI. And you know, I also encourage if anyone has the opportunity to go to Pittsburgh and get the CBI assessment score on your child. Uh, we did it early on for Josie and we watched the improvement over time as we followed the tips in her book. Um, and she's just wonderful, as you can tell. Um, so now we're moving into our final session of the day. We have two more speakers. We've talked a lot about today about what is Foxy One, what we know about Foxy One, the research behind Foxy One. We talked about how to take care of our Foxy One children. And perhaps the most important session of the day is how to take care of yourself as a Foxy One parent. Because I always say, uh, they tell you on an airplane, put your oxygen mask on first before you put the oxygen mask of, on your child. So this is what this is about. How do we take care of ourselves through this journey? And who better than to start with is um, a Fox G1 mom. She's a Fox G1 mom of 29-year-old Sam. And she's also a licensed family therapist. Pam Skillman, please join us. And she's been so wonderful to offer her services to our Fox G1 families as um, a support resource. So welcome, Pam. Thank you, Nicole. I see the clicker. I'm not quite sure I'm going to be able to use it, but we'll <laughs> see. Thank you. Yes. Wow, so I'm feeling so grateful, truly, for a team that has been put together of such fearless leaders. That, that is just warming my heart, and I know that's true probably for all of us in this room and everyone virtually, so thank you so much. I am Pam Skillman. I am a mother to three children. And it is our middle son, Sam, as Nicole just mentioned, who's 29 years old, who has Fox G1 syndrome. I am also a licensed clinical social worker and have been in private practice for over 15 years, working with individuals, families, and couples. It is in these two roles as a mother and as a therapist that I have spoken to many Fox G1 parents. Many of you who have just recently received a diagnosis, some of you who may be in this room today or listening to us virtually. In every one of these calls, the conversation inevitably shifts to telling me about you to asking me about Sam. And when we shift to Sam, I gingerly proceed. Why? Well, the story I tell myself is that you, on the other end of the phone or on the screen, want to in some way better understand your own child and think that hearing about a 29-year-old with Fox G1 might answer some questions for you. Will my child be okay? Will I be okay? What can I expect? So today, here I am to share some of my story. So how is Sam? I'll start with how I always start when talking to a fellow Fox G1 parent. How Sam is now doesn't necessarily say anything about how your child is or will be. All of our children are very different. And unlike many of you here today, we didn't know what was going on with our Sam for a very long time. It was a long, circuitous route to a Fox G1 diagnosis. We found out only a few years ago that he has a frame shift deletion. So how is Sam? At 29 years old, he is dependent on a team for all of his needs. 
toileting, feeding, bathing, and transport. He has just started using a Dynavox with his speech therapist with limited success. When he was four and a half, his seizure disorder became worse and a scary bout one September night led to a long hospital stay. It was then that we made the decision to place Sam in a residential facility in upstate New York. We were sure at that time that this was deci the decision that made the most sense for us as parents, for our then six-year-old daughter Madeline and our newly adopted baby Gracie and Sammy. Would we make that same decision today? I think we would. But I also know that we were in such a fog at the time, sleepless and desperate, that we didn't leave enough space for processing that decision with his older sister, Madeline. Madeline only knew Sammy as her sweet little brother and not her younger brother with complex needs. Complex needs that were overwhelming us as a family. So let's talk about the fog, what no parent ever expects to have to grapple with. A diagnosis that changes the course of your child's life and your life. As I've said, Sam's Fox G1 diagnosis came later for us, but we knew very early on that there were serious challenges. Milestones not met, and those many sleepless nights for us and for Sam. Grief lands very differently for each of us, and this grief is very much about loss. Loss of the child you may have expected, loss of clarity, and a real fear for yourself and for your family. How will we get through this? What will tomorrow look like? A strong sense of a loss of control. The center has not held, and there is no ground beneath our feet. And the hard part about grief is you never know when it's going to be triggered. That sudden reminder that my child is dramatically different than other children in the playgroup or at the playground. The other children all seem so healthy and on track. Present day pain. Jessica Watson, the writer, compares grieving over a child to being like a stone in your pocket. When you walk, the stone brushes against your skin. You feel it. But depending on the way you stand or the way your body moves, the stone's edges might barely graze your body. Sometimes you lean the wrong way or you turn too quickly and a sharp edge pokes you. Your eyes water and you rub your wound, but you have to keep going because not everyone knows about your stone. Or if they do, they don't realize that it can still bring this much pain. There are days you are simply happy, you laugh without thinking, and you slap your leg during the laughter, and you feel your stone. You aren't sure whether you should be laughing. The stone still hurts. You get the idea. As a stay-at-home mom, I felt the most weight of Sam's care and development. I worked hard doing the PT exercises that I was shown bringing him to his early intervention classes, and always feeling like I wasn't doing enough. That feeling was reinforced one afternoon at his early intervention class when an OT showed me how to brush him, and I was told that it would stimulate his nervous system. And she said that ideally, I would do a thorough brush him, a brushing of him every half hour. I was shocked. I well remember getting in the car that afternoon after his class and putting my head down on the steering wheel and sobbing. My stone poked me hard that day. And I can feel some of that pain now as I remember that moment. 
present day grief and a serious case of the shoulds. I know now that what added to our grief were all the times that my husband Steve and I would begin the narrative, what might have been. Today he would be starting kindergarten, tonight he would be going to prom, taking driver's ed, woe is me. There was an overwhelming sense of aloneness and I can imagine that that loneliness is present for many of you as well. Stares in the grocery store, questions from curious children, and feeling the need to explain what is going on for you and your family and your child over and over and over. Other people, even extended family members, can try to say supportive comments, but often it just adds to the loneliness. I remember well when I was on the phone one afternoon with a good friend at the time, and I was sharing with her that I hadn't slept in several nights because I was so scared that Sammy was gonna have another seizure. And she responded, oh, I know exactly what you mean. I didn't sleep last night. Dean has an ear infection. She didn't get it, and it often felt like no one did. So I'm sharing some of our story with you. Some of you may have similar circumstances, similar feelings, and similar narratives. And some of you might have very different feelings and different experiences. But I wanna share what I have learned along the way as a mom and what I know to be true in my work as a therapist. Often, it is hard to know how to deal with extreme loss and grief as you're going through it. And it is only in retrospect that you find some solace and wisdom. I now know what is so important to me, the truth. Hard, authentic, unglossy, messy truth, feeling all of my feelings, the sadness, the hurt, and the pain. And I think that is why when Sam was first diagnosed with Angelman syndrome, and we were at an Angelman syndrome conference, I had an almost visceral reaction when all of the parents at the conference were referring to their angels that didn't make it any easier or any more palatable for me. If anything, it added to my sad feelings, my guilt, my remorse. I also remember the first time I heard the corollary star story, which many of you have probably heard, that you have a ticket to go to Italy, but you get off the plane, and lo and behold, you're actually in Holland. Really? <laughs> Holland has windmills and canals and tulips. It's different from Italy, yes. But that analogy doesn't honor the weight of how utterly and complex this parenting journey really is. So if I were to shift to provide professionally a few ideas, a few takeaways, as Nicole asked, of how to take radically good care of yourself. Let's see if this works. Whoops. There we go. Allow yourself to feel. Susan Murphy, who wrote a book titled Upside Down Zen, writes, nobody said it was easy to stay in the fire, stay alert, and forbear. But the alternative is to suffer what is anyway, but with no true or reliable relationship to it. It won't feel good, but the only way to get past the hard parts is to move through them. Accept what is. There is no alternative. And name how you feel. As a therapist, I give you permission to stand in your kitchen and yell, I am really pissed off right now and this sucks 
at the top of your lungs. Just do it when your kids are at school. <laughs> and don't avoid, don't avoid your feelings. Oops. There we go. We can often stay busy, busy, busy as a way to avoid feeling our feelings. We subconsciously suppress the hard stuff because we think it could be too hard to deal head on with what is. I know I did. We protect ourselves by not feeling our emotions, but that dishonors our suffering. We can get to know our feelings, and when we're feeling overwhelmed and sad, we can be compassionate with ourselves. You are allowed to feel bad. Stay there. Don't sidestep the complicated feelings. This parenting stuff, our parenting stuff, is really hard. Tell yourself that and stay present. So if you'll humor me, I'd like to do just a moment of practicing present moment experience. So if you'll lean back in your chair and get as comfortable as you can, <coughs> uncross your legs, I invite you to close your eyes if that's comfortable, and turn your attention inward. Connect with that quiet, soft space inside. Feel your feet on the ground. Feel your hands in your lap. Feel your neck holding up your head. And turn your attention to your breath. Just watch the inhale as it moves through your nose and into your lungs. And watch how that air leaves your body on the exhale. And do that a few more times, slowing it way down. Letting go of what happened this morning or what might happen later today. Present moment awareness. And you can open your eyes whenever you're ready. But it isn't helpful to worry about what is going to happen tomorrow or to lament all the what ifs about your child. There is plenty to keep you grounded right here and now in this present moment. And it is only when you are in the present moment that you might actually recognize whether that voice in your head is beating you up with shoulds and negative self-talk or if you're being really kind and gentle with yourself. Radical self-care means you are telling yourself moment to moment that you are doing the very best that you can with a really difficult situation. We would never tell a friend who was struggling to get out of bed in the morning, let alone take care of his complex needs child that he should be doing more or doing better. I know that I did the very best that I could do, not just for Sammy and my family, but for me. If I could have done better, I would have, and I know that's true for everybody in this room. So let yourself off the hook. You are doing a heroic effort one you likely never thought you could do. And here's what can happen. 
When you let yourself feel, really feel, you allow a vulnerability and a transparency that is very raw and very real, both and. And it is in this rawness and this place of despair that you just may ultimately find that you have strength and courage that you never thought you had. Broken open. I can look at Sammy now, a grown man with whiskers and chest hair, and feel so much love and compassion for who he is. There's an uncomplicated purity about him. And I can feel gratitude for all that he has brought to our family. More love, more complexity, more raw truth. I'd like to share with you a part of the text from Richard Rohr, the great theologian and contemplative thinker. He says, Right where you are, in the hurt and sorrow, that's where the insight is. That's where the answer is. That's where the wisdom is. The transformation is there. The rebirth is there. And you're not alone. The healing will come, and you will emerge shaped in the merciful womb of the fiercest love, you will emerge lighter, less encumbered, ready for new stories, and transformed by old ones. I said earlier that having Sammy has brought me more pain and suffering than anything else ever has. But I also know that he has brought more meaning to my life than anything else. So stay alert, stay in the fire, forbear. You will come through this, possibly changed in ways you can't even imagine, still with that familiar pebble in your pocket, always. But a pebble, perhaps, with softened edges over the passage of time, a little easier to walk freely and gathered up into a whole different way of seeing and being. And I'd like to share with you the last slide that Madeline, our now 31-year-old, sent me last week. And I sort of couldn't believe that it's so perfectly said exactly what I'm trying to say to you today. Growing around grief, people think that grief slowly gets smaller with, tr with time, but in reality, grief stays the same size, but slowly life begins to grow bigger around it. Thank you.